The Worst Years of My Life, Chapter 9. Check this out. So they're showing his bedroom as he imagines it to be, drum kits, etc. So this is what my room looks like. It's the one place at home I can kick back and be, kick back, be by myself and do whatever I want. Mum says I keep it too messy, but the truth is I just have too much stuff. Okay, I might have been exaggerating a tiny bit here. Really, it's more like this. Just kidding, kind of. So the joke here is that he doesn't have a blanket. They gave you a blanket, they gave me half of one. Chapter 11, Georgia on my nerves. About 12 seconds after I slammed my door, Georgia came a knocking. She knew better than to just barge in. At least I trained her that much. Enter, I told her. She came in and closed the door right behind her. What's going on? Why was he yelling like that? Are you in trouble? She said. In case you're wondering, Georgia is nine and a half years old, in fourth grade, and 100% into everyone else's business. Go away, I told her. I had work to do, a mission to plan. Besides, since when do I need an excuse to not want my sister around? Just tell me what he said, she whined. Here, I gave her one of my pudding cups. He said have a pudding cup, okay? Now get out. She gave me a look that was like, I'm not stupid, but okay, I'll take the pudding cup. And she didn't ask any more questions. Mostly, I can't stand Georgia, but I also didn't want her to get stuck in the middle of anything with me and Bear. She was still the kid in the family after all. Rafe, what I said. Thanks for the pudding cup. You're welcome. Now close the door from the other side. I said and turned my back on her like I expected nothing short of obedience. A few seconds later, I heard her leave. Finally, some peace and quiet. Now I could get down to work and really figure out where this whole mission thing was going to take me next. Chapter 12. So this is what motivation feels like. First of all, it needed a name. I thought about it for a while and came up with Operation Rafe, which, which stands for Rules Aren't For Everyone. I'd be the first kid ever to play Operation Rafe, but not the last. Someday there could be Operation Rafe video games. Rafe Cachadorian action figures. Okay, so it's not the best action hero name. A movie version starring me and a whole amusement park called Rafe World with 16 different roller coasters and no height requirements to ride any of the rides. The whole thing, Rafe Enterprises, would make me the world's youngest million billion trillionaire. Or maybe some kind of heir that doesn't even exist, and I'd pay somebody to go to school for me. So that's his version of himself as a billionaire. Meanwhile, I still had to finish inventing this thing. I decided that every rule in the Hills Village Middle School Code of Conduct should be worth a certain number of points, depending on how hard it was to break. Of course, this meant I could get into some serious trouble, so I decided to make that worth a bunch of points too. And there would be bonuses for things like getting big laughs, or if Jingaletta saw what I did, definitely that. I wrote it all down in a big grid in one of the spiral notebooks mum got me for school. What? This was for school. There's only part of it. Sorry, that's only part of it. There are a ton more rules in the Code of Conduct than that. 112 of them to be exact, but you get the idea. After I was done writing it all down, I started thinking maybe this whole, co this whole thing needed some kind of major ending. Like if Operation Rafe was going to get me through sixth grade, then I should have something big. No, huge as a kind of final challenge before I could go on to the next level, which was the seventh grade. I'd get Leo to help. So he made a bit of a table with different points attached to different things. So talking in class, 10,000 points with four witnesses required. So he needs points and witnesses as well. And it looks like the last, the highest punishment was talking my way out of getting sent to the vice principal's office, the principal's office or detention scored him 100,000 points. So I'd get Leah to help 
and it would be worth half a million points, way more than anything else. It had to be something everyone in the school could see, and everyone would remember long after I was gone. But also, very high risk. I'd have to earn those big points. I still didn't have any idea how I was going to pull this whole thing off. But it almost didn't matter. I just couldn't wait to start figuring it out. In fact, and please don't tell anyone this, for the first time in my life, I was actually looking forward to going back to school. Chapter 13, Off and Running The next morning, Mum set two plates of scrambled eggs in front of me and Georgia, and then sat down to watch us eat. She loves to watch us eat, which I totally don't get. I mean, she works at a diner. She watches people eat all day long. You were both asleep when I got home last night, she said. I'm dying to hear about the first day of school. Tell me everything. I wanted to say, define everything, but that would have been like putting up a neon sign that read, I have something to hide. The thing is, I don't like to lie to mum. I mean, I'll do it if I have to, but she has enough to deal with. So instead, I shoved a piece of toast and a bunch of scrambled egg into my mouth and started chewing as slowly as I could. That meant Georgia went first. Lucky for me, she talks a lot. I mean, a lot. If mum hadn't cut her off, I might have gotten all the way out the door without ever saying a word. How about you, Rafe? She asked when Georgia finally took a breath. What do you think of middle school so far? Well... I said, it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Like Leo says, not telling the whole truth isn't the same as lying. Mum's eyes got all wide, like I just sprouted a second head or something. Who are you? And what have you done with my son Rafe? She asked, joking around. I'm not saying I love it. No, but this sounds like a good start, Mum said. I'm proud of you, honey. You must be doing something right. Whatever it is, just keep doing it. <laughs> oh, I will, I told her, just before I shoved some more scrambled eggs into my big, fat, not quite lying mouth. Chapter 14. Rules were made for breaking. The next few days were just okay. I couldn't top my fire drill from Monday, so I didn't even try. I just stuck to some of the beginner level stuff to keep things moving along. On Tuesday, I chewed gum in homeroom, and Mr. Rourke made me spit it out. 5,000 points. On Wednesday, I ran down the hall, past the office, until Mr. Dwight told me to put the brakes on there, mister. 10,000 points. On Thursday, I took a sneakers out in the library, and Mrs. Frurock, who's about 180 years old, told me to put it away. 5,000 points. I even took a bite before I did, but she didn't notice. No points. By Friday, I could tell something was missing. Just breaking the rules by itself wasn't going to cut it. I needed something more. I needed a boost in my game. I needed, wait for it, Leoizing. He caught up with me in my locker just before 8th period English. And of course, he knew right away what I should do. Leo always does. You're just coasting, he said. If you're going to play this game, then you need to really play it. So I'm going to change things up. You? I said. Since when do you make decisions? Since I came up with half the idea for this whole thing. He told me, here's the deal. It's just, it's 2.26. That means 49 minutes left in the day. That's how long I'm going to give you to earn another 30,000 points. 30,000? I said. That was more than I'd made in the last three days combined. Yep, otherwise you lose a life, he said. Hang on a second. Leo was going kind of fast. F even for Leo. I have lives? Sure, he said, like it was obvious. Three of them to be exact. And what happens if... <laughs> I didn't want to say it. What happens if I lose all three lives? Then you're a big loser. You don't get to finish the game, and the rest of the year will all be will be about as much fun as a case of never-ending diarrhea, he told me. Oh, that's all, huh? Leo shrugged. Gotta keep it interesting. 
That's one thing about Leo. He definitely knows how to keep things interesting. I mean, it's not like just because he says something, I have to do it. But that, but what would you rather do? Play this game by yourself or with your best friend? Yeah, I thought so. Okay, game on, I told him. I looked up at the clock, just as the eighth period bell started to ring. That's 48 minutes and counting, Leo said. Better get busy. Chapter 15. Right and wrong. Right spelled W-R-I-T-E. I got to Ms. Donatello's English class with 47 and a half minutes left in the day. The clock was ticking on my life. One of them, at least. After attendance, Donatello told us that we were going to read parts of Romeo and Juliet aloud in class. It was written by Mr. William Shakespeare, who I believe is famous for writing the most boring plays in the history of the universe. But this is a little advanced, Donatello told us, but I think you kids are up to it. Obviously, she didn't know the first thing about me. Alison Prouty, who raises her hands for everything, helped give out the scripts, while Donatello told us what parts we each had. When she got to me, she said, Rafe, I think you'd make a fine Paris. And everyone in the room started laughing at me. Paris, why do I have to read a girl's part? Paris is a boy, Donatello told me. He's one of Lord Capulet's best men. Yeah, well, he probably still wears tights, I said, but Donatello ignored me. Listen to the language as we read through. Notice how every line has ten syllables. Notice the subtle rhyming. That's not easy to do. Nobody wrote like Shakespeare. Nobody. And I thought, hmm, idea in progress. Please stand by. Let's begin, Donatello said. Act one, scene one. It turned out that this Paris guy, he really was a guy, didn't come in until page 12. That was good. It gave me time to work on my idea. Donatello probably thought I was taking notes like Jenga Letter and the other Brainiacs, but I was actually hot on the trail of those 30,000 points. 10 syllables per line, check. Rhyming, check. By the time we got to my part, there were only a couple of minutes left in class, but I was ready. Act 1, Scene 2, Donatello read, Lord Capulet and Paris enter. Jason Rice was Lord Capulet, and he had the first line. It went something like, Bud Montague is bound as well as I, and blah blah blah. For men so old as weak to keep the peace, and blah blah blah. I told you it was boring. Now it was my turn. I put, my, I put my paper over the script and looked down like I was reading from the right place. Then loud and clear I read, Excuse me sir, there's dog poop on your shoe. Rafe! Donatello shouted, but not as loudly as everyone was, everyone was laughing. So I kept going. Your wife is ugly and your daughter too. I think this play is stupid, so guess what? I'm out of here and you can kiss my... That's as far as I got before Donatello the Dragon Lady ripped the page right out of my hand. There's Donatello ripping the page out of his hand. I knew I was in trouble, but I'll tell you this much. It was totally worth it. Everybody besides Donatello was still laughing, including Jean Galetta. Yes. And the whole thing, and the thing was, nobody was laughing at me anymore. Now they were laughing with me. That's the difference between night and day or wet and dry. Or in this case, winning and losing. Chapter 16. Thin ice is better than no ice at all. Donatello didn't have to tell me to stay after class. It kind of went without saying. Once everyone was going, she gave me a real talking to. What was that about, Rafe? She asked. Nothing, I told her. It wasn't nothing. First of all, let me say that I noticed you kept Mr. Shakespeare's meter and rhyme in what you wrote. Thanks, I said, but your behavior was completely unacceptable. There are much better ways to use your creativity, and I think you know it. I nodded a lot while she talked. It seemed like the right thing to do. Nod, 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 blah, 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 thin ice. I'm going to give you a warning this time. But you're, she said, but you're skating on very thin ice, understood? Nod, nod, nod. I didn't hear a whole lot of what she said. All I could think about was, 
No use of foul or inappropriate language, 10,000 points. Bonus, extra big laughs, 10,000 points. Bonus, Gene G saw, 5,000 points. That was 35,000 points for the day. I'd taken Leo's challenge and blown it out of the water. Even better, I now knew for a fact that Gene Galetta knew I existed. That's what you call progress. As I was leaving, Donatello said, I hope you've learned a lesson, Rafe. <laughs> Definitely, I told her, a really good one. And the lesson was this. There were two ways to play Operation Wraith. The boring way and Leo's way. And I owe. Oh, and I also learned that Leo the Silent is a genius. Chapter 17. The New Rule. When I got home that afternoon, I went straight to my room with Leo. And we started putting everything that had happened so far into my Operation Wraith notebook. The rules I'd broken, the points I'd earned and even some of Leo's points to document the whole thing. We were just messing around, minding our own business, when I heard Bear shout, start to roar from down the hall. What are you doing? He yelled. Then I heard Georgia. Nothing, she said. I just wanted to... I'm watching that. Don't change the channel. But you were sleeping. No, but, he yelled. You can watch the game with me or you can get out of here. What's it going to be? A second later, I heard footsteps. And then George's bedroom door slammed. I hated when he yelled at her like that, even more than when he yelled at me. She's just a little kid and he's, well, he's kind of like a little kid too. The biggest, meanest little kid you ever saw. Pick on someone your own size, I yelled down the hall. Mind your own beeswax, Bear said back and turned up the volume of the TV. It wasn't even worth trying to argue. You know what, Leo said as soon as I closed my door, we need a new rule. I was kind of thinking the same thing I said. Nobody should get hurt from me playing Operation Wraith. Especially little kids, Leo added. And I agreed. I mean, if Miller the Killer accidentally landed on a paper shredder, I wasn't going to cry about it. But otherwise, call it the don't be a bear rule, Leo said. How about just the no hurt rule, I said. Good enough, Leo said, and I wrote that down in the notebook. Rafe's no hurt rule. Nobody gets hurt. All the risks are mine and mine alone. No exceptions. I'm not saying I'm some kind of saint. I'm not even saying this made me a better person, whatever that means. I'm still trying to figure out, I'm still trying to figure that one out. But if putting the no hurt rule into the game could mean me even being a little bit less like Bear, then it was worth it. Because Bear was all about hurting. So we're going to come back to our reading soon with chapter 18.